Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our IPO success, Align Your ERP and Financial Reporting Roadmaps. We are thrilled to have you here with us and with my co-panelists, uh, J.D. Kern of PMV Pharma and Lisa Robinson of NetSuite. We will be starting with some brief introductions And uh, I will turn it to JD to get started. Hi, I'm JD Kern. I'm currently the controller at PMV Pharmaceuticals, uh, a company that uh, IPO'd in 2020, so fairly recent. I am a survivor of three IPOs at this point in my career, uh, but have been uh, here for two and a half years and uh, living with uh, DFIN and NetSuite and all of our other public company um, partners. Great. And I'll hand off to Lisa. Hi, everybody. My name's Lisa Robinson. I'm a senior principal compliance manager at Oracle NetSuite. And my role is um, to run the customer enablement pillar, where I help customers be um, audit ready or deal with compliance concerns on NetSuite or with their systems. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm Megan Miller. I lead the global capital market sales teams here in the Northeast region. We partner with um, organizations like PMV Pharma and as well as advisory firms on a wide range of capital markets transactions. We provide tech-enabled solutions, including a um, product called Active Disclosure, as well as Venue, which is a virtual data room. And we um, look forward to the conversation today. So um, we will get started. Uh, for those of you that were able to join us for the IPO event at the New York Stock Exchange last month, much of the theme was around the gift of time uh, and preparing for the market return. So investor sentiment remains mixed, um, but at present, it does present an opportunity to ensure that when the window opens, that any company that has aspirations of going public can take this time to really get their house in order, ensure that they have the appropriate systems, people, and processes in place, and that will be the focus of our conversation with JD, who not just at PMV Pharma, but as he said, with two other companies, uh, has experience of going through this process. So we'll first start, and I'll pass it to uh, JD to go through just a quick overview of PMV Pharma. Next slide. So uh, yeah, we are PMV Pharma, a relatively young biotech company founded in 2013. Uh, we did IPO in September of 2020, uh, and we do oncology research. So we are a small molecule researcher uh, looking to help cure cancer. Um, so we did start our FDA phase one trials right around the time that we went public. So a lot going on around that time for us uh, at PMV. Um, but like I said, we're a relatively small company. We had to do a lot with very few people. We had we we're up to 62 people now, but we had only 39 uh, when we IPO'd, and 32 of those were research and development, so of no help to me uh, in the accounting department. A lot of PhDs and researchers, not necessarily accountants and finance folks, um, but we got it done. Uh, I was the first hire. Uh, they brought me in to insource the accounting function um, as it had been entirely outsourced for the first seven years of the company. Yes, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll have you share a bit about your timeline specifically, which I know when we were catching up, this is uh, is kind of wild from when you joined what you, what you were tasked with very soon thereafter. Um, but can you just share a bit about what the team looked like? You alluded to it here in terms of um, some of the resources you had, but could you just share the infrastructure and the team at the time of joining and kind of how you went from there? Sure. So the company had been relatively successful in raising private rounds. I think they had been through Series C before I arrived. So they did have a, a heavyweight uh, heavyweight uh, CFO on board a couple of years before I joined. Um, and I think he got the inkling that uh, going public was uh, something in the near future for them. So he pulled me on in May of 2020. Uh, and within a week of my arrival, we had sort of a surprise call with our board of directors where they told us 
that we needed to IPO before the holiday season in 2020. Uh, so for for all intents and purposes, before October. Um, and when I say surprise, it wasn't really a surprise because we kind of had been discussing it. Um, but we had some board members that were getting a feeling that the window for IPOs was closing, uh, especially for biotech firms. And that was definitely true. We were one of the last uh, companies to, to IPO at that, in that time frame uh, and did bring in a, a fair amount of money that has allowed us to operate uh, with um, relative ease up until today. And we've, I think we've even got runway for a few more years. So um, we got in and then the window closed not long thereafter. So it was a good, good thing that we uh, sort of rushed ourselves. Um, and, you know, so when, when I was hired, I was the first accounting hire. Uh, I quickly insourced a, uh, a procurement manager because procurement is not my strong suit, but it was still me doing the heavy lifting on uh, reporting and accounting. I did have two very strong consultants who had kept the books pretty clean up until I got there, um, but um, had to start getting things in place uh, as soon as possible. Um, and you know, get ready for uh, a, a very near, near term IPO. So like I said, I was hired in mid-May, we made the decision in mid-May and we ended up going public in September. So that's June, July, or September, roughly five months from uh, the starting gun to uh, the point where we went public. Perfect. And so when you joined, uh, as you shared, the accounting was outsourced. What did you have in place at that point um, in terms of uh, what were you using when you joined? So we were using QuickBooks when I joined, um, and it was a real still a relatively small company. So QuickBooks was probably appropriate uh, up until the point that I got there. Uh, like I said, we had outsourced our uh, accounting. So we had four-ish consultants who stepped in and stepped out as needed to do accounting and reporting things. Uh, very critically, however, we had started getting audited several years before. So um, long before we made the decision to go public, our investors said, hey, we should probably get an audit for good order's sake. And both a strong set of consultants and um, that audit requirement put us in a decent place in May of 2020 to hit the ground running. Um, but yeah, we did say, you know, in May 2020, I, I ran a process, looked uh, through a couple of different ERP systems, but pretty quickly came to the conclusion that NetSuite was the right one for us. Uh, and we, you know, really started pushing pretty hard. Uh, I filed the first, so we did an S1, IPO in September. I did the first Q, the third quarter Q, and I did the first K by myself, which I would not suggest. Uh, and then, um, I hired quickly, uh, in my mind, quickly, um, a, a very strong technical second in command who has since become our assistant controller and um, uh, has taken a little of that burden off of me. And since then, we've also converted one of our consultants into a full-time hire as well. So we're, we're an accounting department of four at this point. Great. Okay. So it, it, it sounds like, um, and again, in the, the backdrop of all this obviously was COVID. So I think personally and professionally, there was um, some nuances there that I'm sure made this in a very interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, what would you say, you know, in terms of, of being on QuickBooks, having all of these priorities that were kind of staring you in the face, but it, it sounds like some really good uh, governance that was already in place. How did you prioritize sort of getting NetSuite on board in addition to hiring just kind of your day-to-day -day responsibilities? How did you prioritize that with the fact that now you're having to think about S1 preparation? What, what were some of the ways that you, you know, each day you kind of, you know, figured out how, where do I start today? Honestly, it was a bit of a fire drill every day. Um, putting out, put Putting out the fire that was most likely to burn me uh, was how I prioritized, and that's it's a horrible way to live. I would I would not suggest it at all. Uh, I would suggest getting an early start uh, in any way possible. Um, so you know when we when we made the decision to go public, it was you know preparing an S one, it was implementing an ERP system, it was hiring people all at the same time. Um, so I think. Um, because the S1 was getting done and that was something that I was going to be a roadblock for, that typically took precedence in that time frame. Um, and then I would uh, do ERP implementation and such after that. And honestly, we have a fairly you know, simple 
uh, company. So it wasn't, uh, the ERP system wasn't a heavy lift. Uh, and like I said, we were coming from QuickBooks and going to NetSuite, which is a pretty natural progression. So the, um, the NetSuite professional services folks that helped us really had it down to kind of a science uh, and knew exactly how long things would take. And it was a very smooth process. We didn't have any hiccups and we went, uh, we went live and went public <laughs> within a couple of weeks of each other. Um, in terms of getting ready, uh, I would say uh, getting your auditors and keeping them up to date as you're, as you're um, getting through this process is probably one of the key things to do. Perfect. And can you expand a little bit in, in that, just um, you know, how you thought about that, what that rhythm looked like? Um, you also referenced just having really good partners as part of this. Uh, you know, not just your auditors, but the law firms and yeah. some of the ways that you're kind of thinking about um, not just staffing internally, but really externally and the resources that you'll need. Sure. So I, it was a, a whole bevy of partners. It was, you know, financial printers. It was law firms. It was accounting firms. It was consulting firms. We had two or three different consulting firms helping us with legal and accounting things because you can't always rely on your uh, your auditors to help you with that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, my role was kind of coordinating those folks in addition to sort of being the, the technical expert in-house. Um, and so what I would say is uh, if you've got a decent set of investors already, they can probably link you to attorneys that they've used in the past or auditors that they've used in the past. So that's uh, generally first steps. Um, and uh, if you've got a good uh, law firm and a good accounting firm, they will sort of hand walk you through the process because they've been through it, you know, dozens or hundreds of times, whereas, you know, I'm sort of best case scenario and I've only done three times. Um, and so I would, I would consider myself knowledgeable, but not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, as I was thinking about this presentation, the one thing that I thought about was um, auditors. You cannot spring an audit on either a company that has not been audited in the past or even a company that has been audited, but isn't, uh, the auditors don't know you're you're thinking about going public. You can't that can't be a surprise to to your auditors, or they can be a huge roadblock. And it isn't even within their it isn't even within their ability to not be a roadblock. Uh, a lot of the things that they do just take a lot of lead time. Um, sometimes they will have to go back and re audit parts of prior years to make sure that they are uh, ready for being included in a public filing. Uh, and just generally uh, update their procedures to sort of a higher level of auditing standard uh, to, to be a public company. In addition, um, you're also upgrading SOX controls or just controls in the background, um, because even though uh, in your first year, you typically don't have a SOX audit requirement, the SOX controls do have to be in place. Um, and if you either have weak controls or even if you have strong controls, they're probably not SOX ready controls because they are, SOX controls just aren't um, cost beneficial to a private company. Um, but sort of overnight, those, those um, controls become super important. Um, so you have to have them done and ready uh, to turn on sort of at a moment's notice. So, you know, coordinating all that at the same time is is difficult. And I would strongly suggest that you get your auditors teed up uh, sooner rather than later because they can be a roadblock uh, and it's not really even their own fault. Um, because you will, you will have other things to do. There will be, you know, legal things and corporate housekeeping that have to be done. If you've got patents, you need to make sure that they're papered. Uh, you have to have, you know, uh, bylaws and, and amendments and all sorts of things that need to be uh, in place in the background for good corporate governance. Um, and a lot of private companies just don't have that. So, you know, law firm will help you through that, but it's something that needs to be done. So a lot of things that need to be done, um, making sure you have the right people helping you is crucial. Um, we, you know, did not skimp on that. And that was one of the few reasons that we were able to get going and go public uh, in the time frame that we did. We had a big four auditor. We had a major law firm. We pulled in NetSuite and NetSuite's professional services. We had DFIN. Um, we had a lot of heavyweight uh, people helping us and we would not have been able to do it without them. Um, and that, that's certainly a good feeling to have at the end, right? When you've, you've <laughs> that preparation in place um, and you feel like that that contributes to the success. But it really is, I, I think it is a core tenant of, of ensuring that you have the right team surrounding you and really leveraging it, expertise and advice as you go through. Um, one thing I'll have you expand upon there that I think is interesting is as you start to think of your SOX framework as a, you know, a, a 
private company and especially leading up to either public company aspirations or a sale even, you know, how do you think about um, sort of that framework and, and what you should document and, and really like what controls you, you want to be putting in place because it, it is something that um, is a considerable, um, I, I think considerable for the company to have to, to meet those. So how did, how did you think about that at PPD Pharma? Um, so I, I think there's two two points to the answer here is one, we were moving from private level controls to public company level controls, and that's a major step up. Um, I think maybe some companies were strong, more strongly controlled than we are, but I, we had pretty good controls when I stepped in. Like I said, the accounting that had been done up until the point that I arrived was pretty good. I mean, I didn't have to worry about accounting and we had decent controls in place, but we had to upgrade a lot of them and just add people add processes to get them up to, you know, SOC standards. So that's, that's, that's part one is just upgrading from private to public um, controls. The second is just documenting all that. As a private company, the documentation requirements are meager at best. Uh, you have a couple of narratives that describe how your processes work and your auditors will read them and shit and just stick them in a file. Um, you have to document on a much more detailed basis. You have to list out all of your key controls uh, and all of the ancillary controls that aren't necessarily key and how they work and who's doing them and how frequently they're doing them. It's a it's a very heavy lift. Um, and unless you've got an internal audit department, which very few private companies do, uh, you will be uh, doing that from scratch yourself, uh, which is a which is what once again, like I said, a pretty heavy lift. So strongly recommend uh, consultants. Uh, here as well. Don't necessarily have to be big four, um, but some people who know what they're doing is 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 pretty important um, because all of that documentation just takes time. Um, and, you know, you're writing out things that you hadn't thought of before and, you know, listing out the controls. And then you have to put together documentation that you're actually following these controls, right? You know, if you, if you say, hey, I do this control four times a year, you have to have documentation that proves that you did it four times in that year. If you do it every month, you have to have 12 sets of documentation. Um, it's a lot uh, and not to be underestimated. So uh, to, to reiterate, it's just, you know, an increase in controls um, from private to public company and then documentation of that increase. And both of those are a lot of work, a lot of work. Yeah, makes sense. Um... So we were working with PMV on your IPO, and you also are now using active disclosure for your financial reporting. So lots of times we counsel our clients to get in the habit of quarterly reporting in advance of, of being a public company. It sounds like you guys had a really good cadence, um, given the accounting function that you had in place, even while private. But when did you think about implementing active disclosure and, and can you talk a little bit about how that looked in the context of the IPO, um, especially with the quick turn for public company reporting? Uh, unfortunately, and once again, I would not suggest you live your life this way. Uh, we, we definitely made a late decision to bring DFIN on board. Uh, and that was just a function of the fact that there were so many things going on that we didn't have time to think about it. If I had it all to do over again, it's amazing how much easier um, even putting together a filing is when you've got something like active disclosure in the background. Uh, so like I said earlier, I single-handedly did the K for that year for 2020 and the first Q, sorry, the third Q for 2020 and the K for 2020 uh, by myself. And active disclosure is one of the few reasons that I was able to do that because it's very easy to use. Um, with respect to the close, however, so remember once again, we had a pretty um, compressed timeline from when we decided to go to go public. Um, so although we had very good processes and we had the close down pretty cold, we were, we were not rushing ourselves. We were taking our time with closes. So we did have to practice a couple of months to make sure that we could get uh, a close done in a shorter time frame, um, because the you know, reporting process is, is expanded when you're, when you're an SEC company and you need to compress your accounting so that you have more time on reporting. So uh, you know, as soon as we could, we started shortening the close timeline um, to make sure that we could uh, hit a quarter or a year end close time frame. Um, and, you know, much like uh, you want to 
close your books in a new ERP system a few times before you switch over from your old system just to make sure you can do it, I would strongly suggest you close your books as fast as you can uh, a few months or quarters before you're going to go public just to make sure that you can because you can't miss that deadline once you're public. It's it's hard and fast. They, they don't give you um, second chances. Yeah, that's a, a really critical point. And I, I think the more the more practice that you have in place, and as you said, certainly having a system implemented uh, that will work with your ERP system that you also had recently implemented, um, just so that as you're considering, and, and certainly all of these things, the decisions that you were having to be making, um, knowing that the ERP system that you had chosen would work well with your financial reporting system is, is probably a really key consideration as well. Um, okay, so given the, the sort of the condensed time frame that you had, and and that was certainly not due to lack of preparation as you have shared, um, but <laughs> really just the consequence of of the timing and and certainly uh, wanting to capitalize on where you were in the market. Is there anything that you would have changed, or is uh, you have the benefit of of hindsight being twenty twenty? what would you have planned for or anticipated differently? Um, and certainly this experience versus the other two companies that you were in, engaged with an IPO, but, but what would you have potentially looked at through a, a different lens? So uh, once again, it, it, at PMV, we were definitely forced into doing a lot of things all at once. And uh, luckily we had, you know, very experienced people at the helm of every function so that we could get it done in that time frame. If you aren't forced into that, if you have any ability uh, to give yourself the luxury of time, take it. So early planning is crucial um, because you don't want to do everything at the last minute because you will invariably mess things up uh, as I did. Um, I have some war wounds from uh, unfortunately trying to take on too many things at once. But th so there are things that you can do early uh, that will get them out of sort of the crunch time of right before the IPO and things that you can't that will have to happen nearer to the IPO date. So you want to take anything that is, you know, not critically done near the IPO and move it forward. You know, one thing that I would have done differently here is I would have hired sooner um, because being a one man show through that was torture. Uh, and I don't want to say accountants are a dime a dozen, but you can find good people to help you um, relatively easily. Um, you know, uh, there are good people who understand GAP and understand SEC requirements out there, and they love being part of an IPO. So you've got a lot to offer them as an employer. So I would have definitely hired earlier. Uh, I think I would have started the ERP process uh, sooner as well. Like I said, I think QuickBooks is great for a small company, um, but your auditors are going to cry quite a bit if you tell them you want to go public on QuickBooks. Uh, and you certainly don't want that. Uh, so, you know, you can do a you know more thorough or an extended implementation timeline uh, and make sure that you're doing things right. So uh, you know our implementation was great. Um, we we did it very quickly and we got a lot of things right, but we were taking a lot of risks on getting things right and we just happened to get them right at the end. If you don't have to take those risks and you can think things through before you do them, uh, it will definitely help you. And once again, hiring ERP system, those are things that don't have to be done at the last minute. You should definitely be taking that step early if you think you're going to uh, go public. And quite frankly, they're both things that can help you even if you don't go public. If there's an acquisition, if there's, you know, if you're acquisitive, if you're doing another private round, these are things that, you know, even if you don't go public in, in the near future, like you might think you are, you're going to live a better life if you have these things in place anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, people processes, systems, early as you can, because the, 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 like the S1 has to be done, you know, a few weeks before you file, because there are things that are very timely that have to be included in that. You got to be focused on that uh, at the last minute. Yeah. And as I'm sure you uh, also experienced inevitably, as you said, I, I think you mentioned something about the fire that was closest to burning you. <laughs> I'm yes. sure that at, at the time and, and as much as you try and prioritize and, and shift resources appropriately, something is going to come up and it is going to catch you by surprise. You're going to have to shift and, and make decisions. So um, so that's just the reality of going through this, especially in a condensed time frame as well. Um, and, you know, as, as you said, I think it's um, it, it is just 
just that whether your aspirations are down the road for being public, if you're not quite sure what the exit will be, all of the things that you're describing are going to help whichever path that you will take. Um, one of the things that we also counsel clients on is really just the importance of when you start to share data. So whether that's in the fundraising context or internally or externally, really thinking about securely sharing that data in a data room is another is another way to um, to think about some of the the preparations that you can get engaged with. So, um, so a data room the data room was quite crucial to us because remember the timeline that we're looking at was May 2020, so the beginning of COVID. We didn't see each other face to face at all during the entire IPO process. I didn't meet my boss. I didn't meet my attorneys. I didn't meet my auditors. Nobody. There are hundreds of people involved in an IPO, and without a data room, I'm not sure we could have done anything. Yeah, yeah. Especially again with um, with an IPO, it's 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 absolutely critical. Um, even as you're you know going forward in your in your various needs as a as a company, whether that's through m a. Um, it's it's something to be thinking of, especially with all of the data security concerns in place today, knowing that that is one less thing that you have to think about is um is certainly, I think, peace of mind. Um, well, thank you so much, JD. This is great, and uh, hopefully has um has provided some some key considerations for, for those of us on the phone that may be in similar situations. Again, when you have the, the benefit and the gift of time, trying to, to leverage that to ensure that um, when you do have the, the window open, that you're able to focus on the task that will immediately be at hand. And we are going to shift over to Lisa. Hi, Megan. Hi, everybody. So um, JD's story is typical of many of the IPOs we've seen here at, at Oracle NetSuite. And I'd like to share with you some of the trends I'm reading about or seeing with our own customer base and IPOs. And these are what I would consider the um, six high level trends in IPOs. There's a, you know additional SPAC scrutiny and new compliance requirements from the SEC. But, and we're certainly seeing a slower IPO SPAC market and money seems to be a little tighter. Last year, we had much more IPO activity, regardless that the pace is slower this year, but companies are still in a position. Uh, there's still some money out there and they're planning their exit strategy. And now you have more time to prepare. And this is really your opportunity to take the time to get it right. Sort of like what we heard JD said, make this repeatable. Do it, it your first time through shouldn't be when you do your IPO. You should have a nice tight close process well before then. We should be seeing more quality IPOs with fewer material weaknesses in the future. And your very first audit, for example, may fall under a PCAOB inspection and you have no control over that. The PCAOB selects audits for inspection using both risk-based and random methods. And most are based on an, on an evaluation of audits that present a heightened risk of um, a material misstatement or based on economic trends, they may target you or industry developments or your market cap. Your auditor has no influence over whether the PCAOB is going to look at your audit or not. And in the past, you may have only had a review or compilation while, while an audit is the highest level of financial statement services an audit can perform, I think an auditor can perform. I think we heard JD say that, um, you know, you're, this can't be a surprise to your auditor. So, you know, make sure that, that they're on board and you bring them along along the road with you. Um, you know, the uh, the purpose of an audit is provide financial statement users with an opinion by that auditor of whether the financial statements are prepared in accordance with proper financial uh, reporting framework. And having repeatable processes, being able to close your books in the same number of days every month, having documented policies, procedures, and a tight close um, it shouldn't it, it it shouldn't be something you're striving for after the IPO. You should be doing it well before the IPO. You should be good at these things beforehand. And then let's think about financial reporting. Well before your IPO, you, your first round of investors had you had new stakeholders. They they surely were asking you for um, more KPIs, benchmarks, and metrics on how you're running your business. You need to have strong financial reporting um, flexibility and capabilities. And it it really goes way beyond the cash basis reporting of a of an early startup. Um, you can't just look at your bank account for a measure of how you're doing. 
And then what about compliance requirements? Think about the compliance requirements you may be facing in your, in your industry beyond the accounting requirements. What regulations must you follow and report on? There's taxes, legal, licenses, employee, uh, FDA, privacy. R really, the list is daunting. And are you ready to meet those needs? You need to consider all of your compliance requirements. And then uh, material weaknesses. So I touched on this in the uh, first part of the uh, slide. Um, there have been many material weaknesses reported in recent S1s and S1s recently. Uh, KPMG conducted a study that found, I think it was 26 to 42% of recent IPOs over since 2020 have disclosed material weakness filings. And then the, the root cause of the most material weaknesses disclosed in these S1s is a lack of resources. And we heard JD say that he brought in strong, he, he brought in strong consultants that knew their analytics and knew how to analyze these complex transactions for proper accounting treatment. You want to make sure you're doing that. Getting the right people in place matters a great deal. Again, he hired strong consultants. But other material weaknesses are typically the result of control gaps, controls or processes that have not been properly designed, rather than controls that fail to operate, including uh, segregation of duties, uh, material or numerous year-end adjustments. Those always look bad. And then a lack of policies and procedures are or having, when I say segregation of duties, let me go back to that one real quick. If everybody in your company is an administrator of all your systems, that's almost always a material weakness. So you want to look at um, all the, all your controls well before you get into your um, IPO or your um, preparing for your S1. Um, companies should also not uh, overlook the technology aspect of financial reporting. Often systems used by private companies are not able to scale to the requirements of public companies. Um, additionally, IT, uh, IT general controls and application controls are not properly implemented to ensure financial information is either appropriately safeguarded or accurately processed. So a strong IT team, again, this is about your people, your processes, and your technology. A strong IT team and well-implemented and controlled systems are critical to ensuring your internal controls over financial reporting are dialed in. And you want to get these dialed in to see a higher quality IPO. And to recap this slide, and I think you heard, again, you heard this from JD, you're hearing it from me, we're seeing it in our, in our customer base at, at NetSuite. A well-run company, it doesn't have to be pub, doesn't have to be going public or they don't have to be public to have good controls. Um, you know, whether it's Kathy's Cakes or Todd's Taco Truck, these companies, the small mom and pops, they need good internal controls too, and they need good compliance from the start. You don't want to wait to have your IPO to think about controls. So let's go to the next slide. So JD's, uh, oops, let's see if that, oh. So JD kind of talked about being audit ready and, and talked about his systems. When we talk about audit enablement, we're talking about having systems and tools in place to support your optimal outcomes. Again, you want to have a repeatable system of controls. Technology can help you standardize, optimize, and automate your business processes. Modern technology and your system should support this with self -serve, things like self-service workflows, data visualization tools, analytics tools that give you efforts. You can reduce efforts on low value activities, you could standardize and automate your high value activities and allow you the ability to build and deploy specific advanced solutions. Your accounting system should have these characteristics. This is why companies don't, shouldn't, I don't know, FDX went public on, on QuickBooks, bad idea. Um, your accounting system should have these characteristics. Financial process controls with save search email alerts. You should be able to build your rules, your accounting rules, build your delegation of authority into, into your ERP. You should be able to have records tracking. You should have transaction audit trails, even to the line level. Isn't it great to see who's doing what in your systems? What changed and why did it change? changed. Um, detailed audit functionality on reports, your searches and permissions in most records, the things you hand to your auditors, you should have an audit trail on, on how those were created and how they've been uh, maintained. You should have basic audit trails on your automation, on scripting, on workflows, and any customizations that you're doing to show when these were created and how they've been changed. You should have, you should be able to monitor your roles. Your system should allow you the ability to look at your segregation of duties and understand who has access to what aspects of your system and data. Your system should also include um, configurable IT applications application controls that can satisfy a wide range of SOX controls. How much automation can you do to get off your spreadsheets? Um, uh, you, 
it's great if you have an auditor role, if your system can support an auditor role where you can give your auditor view only access to the system, maybe prepare a dashboard for them that would provision all the PBCs to them that they need. It's kind of a nice, nice to have. You may not, some CFOs would say, my auditors are never getting in my system. And other CFOs would say, I have nothing to hide, let them in, they can view anything they want, but uh, that's completely up to you. Um, but think about those when you're looking at your system design. And let's go ahead to my, let's go to the next slide. This is kind of a, it's kind of a big deal to me. I kind of think it's important to um, talk about third party risk considerations. Third parties can be everything from software vendors to consulting firms, contractors you hire off the street, sub processors, your data center providers. This is just a sample of some possible third parties. You want to make sure that you that you don't have a failure to assess the third party risks that, that expose your company to supply chain attacks, data breaches, reputational damage. Every third party you're doing business with brings with it multi multi-dimensional risks that extend across the suppliers, vendors, contractors. Um, consultants, service providers, these risks in your supply chain can be reflected in who has access to your internal company information, customer data, systems, processes, or other privileged information. And this can include non-system providers, somebody who's just offering a service. They're not adding software to you. They're just, whether it's an individual or a large corporation, um, it's your responsibility to know who has access to your data and what they're doing with it. And ask your service providers at a bare minimum for their SOC reports. And a SOC report can help you understand how services are being performed, um, identify any risk control gaps. Again, when you read those SOC reports, you'll understand where you have to add complementary user controls. Um, to mitigate the risk to, and residual risk to your company. It's not just a check the box exercise and I can't emphasize enough how many people think their job is done when they hand the SOC report to the auditor. And trust me, your auditor has seen the report before and they probably have, have seen clients ignore the complimentary user entity controls. And really think about, um, as JD said, he hired, one of his first hires was a purchasing or procurement uh, type role. Plan to manage your third parties with repeatable and documented selection process of your providers. Have a good negotiation um, uh, plan to understand the terms of service. You're going to need to monitor performance to the terms and develop a process for terminating these relationships and know how to get out. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to Megan. I'm impressed, Lisa. That was great, great content, uh, great content in, in probably a relatively short period of time. So thank you. Um, one of the, the key things that I'll, I'll take away from, from Lisa's last slide is, again, how are you communicating and sharing information with any of the parties that you're engaging with? And really to kind of take a step back and, and think about that um, in, a, in a more secure way. <clears throat> and um, we will we will leave you hopefully with some key takeaways today. And, and JD, thank you again for recounting your experience, um, specifically at PMV Pharma, but really capitalizing on, on your prior experience and really the importance of good partners and advisors leading up to and throughout the IPO process. I think JD would agree. It's, it's probably never too early to start to think of those. And uh, getting financials organized and audited on an ongoing basis, I think that this was probably one of the key success factors, just knowing that that wasn't another variable that you now had to consider, especially given the, um, the short timeline. What it also enabled PMV to do is to capitalize on the timing that they, that they wanted to. Um, and lastly, just implementing core systems and controls, certainly NetSuite and active disclosure being two critical ones to the uh, ongoing financial reporting and, and ERP success here. So, um, and I will, uh, I'll just have you note in the Q&A and JD and, and Lisa, if you guys want to come back on, um, JD, thank you for, for answering some questions in the chat function. I was just kind of reading where you had uh, shared. So for those of you on the phone, there's some additional great information um, relative to just some questions that we've gotten as we've gone through about closed schedule, um, you know, just in terms of how JD thought about FP&A. So definitely take a look um, here. JD, I'll ask if uh, anything you, you wanna comment on in closing. 
Sure. So uh, actually, I will reiterate one of the questions that was asked in Q&A, and they asked, hey, as a small company, how did you deal with segregation of duties? And yeah, that's something that we really struggled with, and quite frankly, still struggle with to this day. We're not a large company. We don't really um, have a lot of people to uh, rely on in the accounting department. But what we do do is drag unwilling parties into the uh, accounting function. Uh, so other like C-level or VP-level people we will drag them in to review the transactions in their area as sort of a detective control where we don't have a great segregation of duties within the accounting department. Um, so unfortunately, deputizing people who don't want to be accountants um, is uh, one way to get past that. Uh, and uh, our auditors helped us figure that out, but it was, uh, it was a learning process along the way. Another thing that I'd like to, to, to riff on a little bit is something that Lisa said earlier is the SOC reports that you get from your third party advisors. Um, that is something that you get and typically file as a private company. But as a public company, you have to read those things and they're huge and ugly. And then you have to document that you read them. And you have to document all of the controls that you put in behind them. That is one of the great examples of going from private, uh, private to public company controls that uh, take, takes a lot of time where it didn't take any time before. And JD, I'd like to go back to your comment about the about segregation of duties. So a lot of the customers start out, start out on NetSuite. They're very small. They have one admin. That admin's also typically the CFO. I would I would tell you when I was a NetSuite <laughs> customer, I was at a small company and I was the CFO and the NetSuite admin. I was not a great admin. It was it was uh, it's something that really needs as part of a progression. Companies will go through. Um, when we brought in private equity, we moved the administration into an into an IT position. So that I wasn't adding users and making changes that I shouldn't have been doing as CFO, but uh, it was. Um I, I think it's uh, it's an evolution. So when you have four customers, you may have an admin who's also booking transactions. But I will tell you that that's almost always a material weakness for I, I can't imagine an audit firm not not having you take your uh, administration out of the accounting department and putting it somewhere else. So even you know you can have your if your CEO or your your owner or founder is not in NetSuite living in NetSuite every day. You, as a, I guess a small company could put it there as long as they weren't also influencing their booking transactions. But there's, it's a challenge, and SOD is is certainly when for a, a, one of the biggest ones for small companies. Yeah, absolutely. As as a small company, that was easily the largest control challenge that we faced. Something to note. It, <laughs> did you mention JD that you that your first audit that you did go through was a was a PCAOB targeted audit? <laughs> we did not. Which uh, okay, was, that uh, was not you. Okay, extra, no, that that was me. We just didn't, didn't mention it on the call here. That was an extra bit of fun that was added at the end. Uh, but we did we did great. Uh, the auditors they, there were no comments on our audit, so um, evidently our auditors did their job and we did ours. That's that's a win. Yeah, which is the exact outcome that I think uh, all of that hard work and, and probably loss of sanity um, <laughs> would uh, would contribute to. So, um, well, again, I just want to I want to thank first our uh, our attendees today. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that this was helpful as you start to think about your potential plans moving forward. And uh, Lisa and JD, wonderful to have you join us today. Thank you so much for imparting uh, both your experience and your wisdom. And uh, again, thank you all for uh, for a great a great uh, time today. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank Megan. you. Bye bye.